Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to our Perkinema webinar, More Predictive Results in Cell-Based Assays. By combining target-based and phenotypic approaches using our new Endside Multimode Plate Reader. Let me get started by introducing our speakers. So my name is Volker Eckert, I'm the Portfolio Director for Multimode Detection and I'm based in Hamburg in Germany. Now we'll give you an introduction on our new insight. The second talk will be given by Norbert Garbo. Norbert is our principal application scientist based in Hamburg as well. And he will give you more insights into the new cell imaging technology. Our guest speaker, Phil Gribben from the Fraunhofer IME screening part and he is the head of the screening, will give you a presentation on uh, assay development for anti-cancer drugs. So what will you learn in this webinar? First of all, how you can combine cell imaging with labeled and label-free technologies to gain more predictive results in the drug discovery process. How to improve your data quality and reduce your cost in cell-based assays by using our recently launched Endsight Multimode Plate Reader. Last but not least, and that is part of the last talk given by Phil, Endsight Cell Imaging, how this approach can give you new insights and new um, ideas for anti-cancer drug discovery. Before we go into the details, I'd just like to give you the big picture for Perkin Elmer and how we hope and support you for translational research. What we mean by that is that we want to reduce the cost per data point and give you more clinical relevance. Now we talk about the insight and these are the first steps in the process. So what is the insight multimode reader with cell imaging? First of all, it's the only benchtop system to offer multimode detection, alpha, label free, and imaging on board. You have a fully orthogonal approach, which means you can run target based assays, phenotypic assays, or a combination of the two. And last but not least, you have a new image based cytometry module on board, which can be used for four colors bright field digital face imaging at high speed. When we talk about high speed, we mean four minutes per color to read a 384 well plate. So what type of assays can you run on the inside? Before we go into details, I'd like to draw the picture for our portfolio. So for biochemical assays, we have the lab ship, easy reader, mobility shift assays. And as you can see here, you can divide it all assays in the biochemical space or cell-based assay space. Now I'd like to draw your attention on integrated well, part of cell-based assays, which basically means you get one well for your cell-based assay as readout. And here we have the Victor, the Envision, and the Vulux. Now new on board is the Insight. Now I'd like to draw your attention to the right side, to cell imaging for cell-based assays. Here we have subcellular resolution. And here we offer the operator as well as the recently launched operator Phoenix. What not really perfectly is covered is the space in between what we call cytometry. And now with the new insight plus the imaging capability, we fill this gap, we build the bridge for cellular assays and that is the new exciting thing to present today. So what can the insight offer? Let's get started for the multi-mode detection mode. So firstly, you have a true orthogonal system for target-based phenotypic or the combination. You can run all conventional MMD technologies plus label-free and the cell imaging in one workflow. I've mentioned already the fast image-based cytometer module. Important to know is that all technologies are field upgradable and it's perfectly suited for the mid-range market and budget. Now we come closer to the high content world 
what can the Insight offer here? First of all, it's a perfect tool for simply assays at cellular resolution. Again, a true orthogonal approach because the people here get access to conventional MND technologies, including label-free. It's made for the ease of use and no special trainings required. If you take the Insight upfront high content instrumentation, you can free up your high content site and can use it as a kind of preschool screening tool. Last but not least, if there are any restriction in terms of budget or space, the Insight might be a good option. So in summary, what is the Insight? New software on board, our Kaleido software, workflow-based, new instrument control and data structure, and we can offer you customized imaging data evaluation. Hardware, the new look and feel. We've added new technologies on board, and as I already pointed out, all technologies are field upgradable. The cell imaging is the new exciting technology on board. You have single cell resolution, for example, for cell counting. You have a fast 96384 well reading, and you can combine it with conventional MND technologies. So what other features do you have? First of all, the fast, flexible, and powerful software. It's workflow-based, and we integrate it in the background, our a uh, acapella engine, which is well known in the high content world for fast data analysis. I've pointed already out the modular design for all technology that gives you a customized tailored system to your current needs and budget, and you are ready for future upgrades. With the integration of imaging, you have access to image-based fluorescence, labeled or multicolor assays, and two stainless methods like bright field and digital face contrast imaging. You can use this to increase the quality of your cell-based assays. And Norbert will give you more insights in this part. In addition, we have a special Perkin Elmer owned optical design, which includes laser fast autofocus and a scientific CMOS camera. With this, you have high performance at low light and high speed. Mentioned already uh, a cappella, so we have pre written data analyze modules, which helps you to analyze in an easy way the cell imaging part, and you get leverage of, over, of our over 10 years experiences in high content. Last but not least, we have a broad range of application, multimode detection, label free and imaging, ready to go for multiplexing or orthogonal workflows. So here you have our nice software, the Kaleido at a glance. Let me walk you a bit through. On the top is the workflow, which helps you to set up a protocol, run a protocol, and uh, reanalyze your data. On the left side, you can select your technologies of interest, for example, alpha, label-free, imaging, time resolved, whatever is of your interest. On the right side, you find the plate map. Here you can determine the number of positive, negative controls, um, unknown, and standard concentrations. In the centrum, you have the content area. Here you'll find graphs or results. So in summary, quick and easy setup, and you can run your essays with use of pre-programmed protocols. You can analyze and reanalyze your data. You can do it on the instrument PC or in your office. And last but not least, you get displayed your results as numerical list, graph, plate view, or a seat map. So what kind of technologies can you find on the inside multimode reader? I go from the right to the left side, absorbance, fluorescence, bottom and top reading, time-resolved fluorescence, 
ultra sensitive luminescence. Alpha technology, EPIC level three, and now our well imaging. With these technologies on board, you can run different assays in one workflow. And here you see the overview. So alpha assays, fluorescence assays, absorbance of course, lens or the fear assays, luminescence assays like our ATP light, the EPIC label free assays, and now on top image-based cytometry, which gives you access to fluorescence, bright field and digital face imaging. Now I'd like to come a step closer to the well imaging module and you will get in a second more details given by Norbert. So what do you find here? Mm -hmm. First of all, we have four LEDs for excitation. So in the UV range, in the blue range, in the green and in the red. On top, we have emission light, which is required for bright feed and digital, digital face contrast. We have a very fast laser-based autofocus, which helps us for short reading times. We have a very sensitive CMOS camera, which helps us to read at high speed in a very sensitive way. And we have a special optical design, more details to come by Norbert. And last but not least, all these technologies are combinable with other multi-mode detection. I'd like to stop here with an overview of different applications. So what can you done? What can you do with our new module? Cell counting and normalization, cell tox assays like live dead, apoptosis proliferation. You can have a closer look to cell migration, cell signaling like reporter genes. It's a perfect tool for phenotypic assays and here they will give us more details and clone selection. Important to understand is all these type of assays, I'm very sure there are more to come, you can run at cellular resolution in an endpoint or kinetic mode for fixed or live cells. And again, combinable in one workflow with conventional MMD technologies or label free. And that leads you to the holy grail of orthogonal conformation. And with this, I'd like to hand over to Norbert for the second part of our talk. We'll see his <coughs> slides now. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry, I, have, I forgot. At the end, we have reserved about 10 minutes for question and answers. Yeah? So okay. please, if you have questions in between, type in your questions on the left field. Thanks. Thank you, Volker, for the introduction. As Volker already did point out, the Insight is capable to run all the currently available multi-mode detection technologies plus imaging. So I'm going to focus on the imaging opportunity only. As a starting point, some more background on, on the optics. We designed the instrument and the optic in a way that we can ensure single cell optical resolution and ensure also a very large field of view to focus on good statistics over many cells. So we can easily image a full well in 384 well, well plates. Even for a 96 well plate, we almost get the complete well. The typical resolution is roughly three microns of the sample per pixel on the camera, which is sufficient for single cell resolution. We have up to four fluorescence channels with using different LEDs for excitation, plus the two imaging modes, bright field and digital phase imaging, which do not rely on any fluorescent stain, but also do not interfere with that. We know that image analysis can sometimes be a very tedious story if you have to set it up. Uh, coming from the high content world with a lot of background in there, and using the prudent algorithm coming from there, did invest quite a lot of work to simplify the image evaluation task for the user and prepared a set of predefined evaluation methods, which cover a large range of different applications. This selection of evaluation methods for image, eval 
image analysis will continue to grow and is also customization tunable for customer applications. You have seen this figure before. Uh, the imaging module consists, well, we have the sample carrier, of course, which holds the, um, the cells. Face, so I mentioned image using a forward magnification lens. We have a set of fluorescence excitation diodes. Uh, and we have a multi-band dichroic optic to separate excitation band and fluorescence emerging from the sample carrier. So if we excite the sample, we just need to switch on a single LED that excites the sample. The fluorescence emerging from the sample is imaged through the multiband detection optics onto the CMOS camera. If we now want to switch to a different wavelength, we just can switch on the next LED and do the same story in another color. So we don't need any mechanical movement to switch between wavelengths, which speeds up the whole measurement process significantly. At the end, we come up for a 384 well plate with typically four minutes in a single color and five minutes in a dual color measurement. As an example for fluorescence images, we have here a two color experiment. The nuclei have, has, have been stained with serous, the cytoplasm using a micro tracker marker and the overlay results in a colored image. My personal favorite currently is, however, the stainless imaging. And for this, we can use the fifth LED in the imaging module, which is placed above the sample. It illuminates the cells from behind, and the cells are then imaged by the microscopic setup onto the camera as before. The figure here shows the field of view in a bright field image. You can see easily that on the left panel more than a well of a C8 or well plate is imaged with one shot. If you look carefully you may be able to see also the next well looking at the rim of the picture. The right side is of course 196 well plate where we can image most of the well, just a little ring, a uh, little piece is cut on top and in the bottom. How much is cut, of course, depends on the sample carrier in use. You also notice that the intensity distribution in these wells is a bit varied with a bright center and decreasing towards the rim of the plate of the well. This is due to the liquid surface of the sample carrier and this distorts actually the intensity distribution of the well. But the image analysis does handle this properly and it does not disturb the results. By the way, the figures you have seen in the last slide are the only one which shows a full view uh, of the camera in this slide deck. The next images are all cut down to the size of the barrel or even further for detailed views. Here I have a comparison for the two stainless imaging modes. The bright field image on the side, here you can nicely, hopefully, you can detect in this display the, the individual cells, uh, but they are not clearly separated from the background. In the digital face image on the right side, uh, we did add quite some mathematics to clarify the display for individual cells. The picture actually looks quite similar to a nuclear stain, but it is free of any stain. Indeed, the digital face image is just calculated from bright field images. It does not require any special add-on optic, optics as you may be familiar with from the phase contrast microscopy. The digital phase image can also be used to segment individual cells as a starting point for further analysis of fluorescence assays or for, to characterize or just count the cells in a well. A few set of imaging applications on the inside we are currently working on. And for the rest of the presentation, I would like to focus on a few 
starting applications like cell counting using different methods, like quality control using no stain at all, or using a stainless live dead assay. So this figure displays two different cell types. On the left side, A431 cells, on the right side, HeLa cells at different density, cell densities. You can clearly see that the boost state nuclei are located in different grow patterns. So the HeLa cells are quite evenly distributed over the valve, while the A431 cells grow in patches. For both cell types, it's pretty easy to segment the cell, the cell signal into individual objects. This is done in the top display of this figure. You may recall the bow-shaped cell group here in the center of the image, which was shown before. It's also shown in the figure below, and it will come up in the next figures as well. Um, the nuclear stain easy, easily allows to count the cells. In the confluency analysis on the lower display, we cannot count individual cells, but estimate or calculate the area that is covered by cells. As you see already by eye, the degree of confluency is much higher in this case for the HeLa cells than for the a ones. In this display, we again have the bow-shaped group of cells here in the um, cell counting image, but we did not use the nuclear stain in the top display, but just the digital phase image, and for the left side, including the segmentation information. For comparison, the boost state figures are shown below. And they look on the first side very similar. If you look closely, you may find some differences. So we did <coughs> compare sec numbers and cell densities using four different methods. Of course, during the seeding, we had the cell counter for the different cells uh, and determined the seeding density of the cells. We used nuclear staining to count the individual nuclei using a fluorescent readout. We did cell counting using digital phase imaging without taking the nuclear stain into account. And we did determine the degree of confluency also without using the staining information. All these four methods correlate nicely. For the following parts, we need a bit more background on the determination of confluency. What you can see in this figure is a detailed view of HeLa cells, which nicely attach to the, uh, to the valve. So most cells are quite expanded. There are a few cells that are rounded up. And what you can see in this area covered by cells are basically intensity fluctuation caused by the cells. And the intensity basically follows the shape of the cells. In the background areas, which are not covered by cells, there is virtually no change of the signal on the size scale of a cell. And actually the method that calculates the confluency does calculate on the changes of intensity on the cell size scale. We call this texture parameter roughness, so it's a specialized evaluation for this kind of analysis. As you can see here, the rounded up cells on top also give quite significant results in the roughness parameter, and this may be quite helpful for future analysis of specific cells. Therefore, the confluency calculation does not only return the expected degree of confluency, so a percentage of the area covered by cells. In this case, I think it was something like 35%. It also gives information on the, the roughness parameter, the intensity of the texture structure in the cellular area, which we name foreground roughness. It gives information on the 
this parameter in the background and on the maximum compared to the minimum roughness values in the valve, which sometimes cause uh, yeah, surprising additional insights into your samples. What can we do with simple dry field imaging? Well, it's quite obvious that one of the most important applications might be just a simple control of cell culture. In the left figure, we have the cells as we expect them. They are not disturbed by anything and grow with a medium degree of confluency. The center and right display are somewhat disturbed. For the center display during cell seeding, there was a bubble on top of the liquid which skewed up the, uh, the cell seeding procedure. And on the right side, uh, there was a, the cell layer was scratched using a pipette tip. This can easily be detected with this kind of analysis. Sometimes we can also get some surprises. On the left display here, we see MCF7 cells, which attach nicely to the cell area. The cells <coughs> in the cell covered area, there are some objects which are rounded up, probably dead cells. And between the cell covered area, there is virtually nothing, just plain gray light. On the right side, we have a well that has been contaminated by bacteria. The bacteria destroy the cells, so the roughness within the cell covered area reduces pretty much. On the other side, the cells also grow on the bottom of the well and increase the texture parameter here. So the range of textures is significantly reduced and that's a parameter that is independent of any threshold for confluency determination and really is helpful to determine if there are any strange artifacts are coming up. Of course, we can use the determination of confluency also for some basic assays like like, like that assay without using any fluorescent stain. On the left side, we have HeLa cells that have been incubated without BMSO. These cells are spread out as we uh, are used to. There are some, but not very many dead cells or rounded up cells. On the right side, the same number of cells has been incubated with about 4% DMSO overnight. And in this case, the cells are rounded up. They use only a very small area they do cover uh, and have as rounded up cells a larger contrast so the texture is increased. If you check uh, for this assay, we compare the confluency prior to cell treatment with the confluency after cell treatment. And if we do this for all the concentrations available, we see on the left display that the area covered by cells, the degree of confluency increased with low concentrations of the MSO. So we get positive numbers here. With higher concentration of DMSO, of course, the confluence decreases, the cells do shrink. Actually, it was a bit of a surprise to see that with about 0.5% DMSO, these cells seem to grow even faster. So here the confluence increased from something like 35% uh, to about 40-44%, uh, growing by roughly 8%. On the right side, the display shows the texture parameter found in the area of the cells. Also compared after incubation with the value before incubation. With slow DMSO concentrations, we find that the texture was reduced during the incubation time. At higher DMSO concentration, of course, the texture increases, indicating rounding up of the cells. What might lead to a reduction of the texture during incubation? Most likely, in this case, there have been dead cells already before treatment, which have, as they are rounded up, quite some impact on the average texture parameter. During incubation, the dead cells did not grow, but the still healthy other cells 
did grow, did continue to grow. And just the fraction of healthy cells became larger and the average roughness parameter decreased with that. So I did show you that the confluency de determination is a valuable tool to analyze your cells, be it for quality control to label cell uh, wells that might be somewhat affected by disturbances or just to confirm that everything is perfect as you would like to see it. It can also be used for some essays. I did show you that the digital face images can be used to count cells even without any stain. That can also be used as a cell segmentation information in combination, for example, with fluorescence for transaction rate analysis without any need of additional stains. I did not show you some other methods we are working on, like migration assays. And with that, I would like to hand over to Phil. So thank you very much, Norbert. Phil, so give me a second to load up your slides. OK, here they are. OK, thanks a lot, Norbert. Thanks a lot, Volker. Um, so I'm Phil Gribben from the IMA Sweden Port, and I'm also based here in Hamburg. And today I want to talk about some of the work that we're doing in anti-cancer drug profiling. Um, we have a, a well-established setup here, and our standard of, or, or method of choice up to now has been ATP quantification using the cell type of rule method. But in these um, preliminary um, work on the Ensite reader, we've been trying to um, set up a comparison with what the types of parameters we can um, get with the, um, the bright field analysis in terms of confluency and in terms of morphological readouts. So, quickly. So just, a, uh, just one or two words about the screening port and who we are. Um, we're involved in um, small molecule drug discovery. Um, we have access to over half a million compounds and a, a number of um, automated screening systems, including some from Beck and Elmer. And we work across a number of indication areas, uh, particularly CNS, neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular, but also we have several cancer programs. We have a biomarker group um, working in translation research based at the hospital here. We have a particular interest in, in life science informatics and big data solutions. But I think what's relevant here is that we, um, we work with um, organizations like Kirk and Elmer who are developing novel technologies to aid the drug discovery process. And we want to work with those to develop and, and benchmark those technologies to give us better, better ways to identify compounds and subsequently confirm those compounds so we can increase the chance of translating from the in vitro to in vivo and hopefully through to the clinic. So if we look at the, um, the typical workflow in a, um, a cell toxicity assay, um, in, in this case, we, we've taken on board the NCI 60 panel from the National Cancer Institute. It's 60 different cell lines representing a wide range of different cancer types. Um, and for those, we've developed um, protocols based upon the, the cell type of method where we're using ATP determination. And um, those protocols involve um, three or four assay formats. And typically, we're seeding the cells, and uh, 24 hours later, we're adding the compounds, incubate for a further 48 hours, and then we're trying to establish what the, the cell viability is there. And, and from these types of measurements, we're able to identify cytostatic effects and also cytotoxic effects. Um, if we look down now to the next slide. Um, here's just a quick overview of the ATP detection system, and I guess most people know it, but I'll give you a few words on it. In this case, ATP is used as a um, detection of ATP is used as a surrogate for the number of cells. So the higher level of ATP you have, and um, the greater turnover of the um, fetal reciprin into oxyreciprin, and the release of light and luminescence signal emerges. And um, we've been doing our detection up to now using the um, classical Envision of the previous generation of reader from Kirk and Elmer. And what it gives you is actually pretty remarkable linearity between uh, conventionally determined um, cell number and cells per well um, versus the, the luminescence signal. And this is some data from the, um, the Kaiser formula. 
all of our assays are configured for um, 20 micrometer from say E to E4. Um, so this is again just looking at what you would do conventionally with an ATP determination here and um, the, the panel on the top left. Um, you're doing your DMSO tolerance. And this is pretty much what you've seen with um, the, 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 um, the data up to now from Norbert. You get a decrease in um, cell viability with increasing DMSO. And the next stage in validating each of these assays is to check the linearity. You can see it here on the second panel. This is for, for the 786 renal cell cancer line. And you can see actually you get a um, pretty remarkable level of linearity from tens of thousands of cells all the way down to several hundred cells. And that means you can run assays with as low as 1,000 cells per well quite successfully. The next stage in, in your validation is to look at a set of standard compounds. Here we're looking at the dose responses of a, a range of um, compounds of cisplatin, 6 mercaptopurin, storosporin, and, and taxel. And you can see here that some of those cytotoxics and some of them are less so. I think what's quite interesting is that we always try to do a, a counter assay when we're, when we're running these types of assays. And here is a, an example with um, cisplatin, whereby we have the, the dose responses um, for the cisplatin itself is the, in the dark well, it's the dark line, sorry. You can see, see here that's coming down. But also if you measure the cell viability immediately after adding the compounds, you can create a counter assay. And you can see in this case that even with zero at zero time of incubation, your counter assay is showing significant um, cytotoxic or apparent cytotoxic effects, um, which are, are not real. They're essentially, an artifact, and it's the cisplatin which is interfering with the reciprocal support system. And this is pretty much the same as any any normal report system. That you're going to have compounds which will interfere with it, and you really want to try and move away from that, and especially if you're getting large scale screening. Um, as I mentioned now, we're, we're using the, the, the cell type of grow as a, um, a phenotypic assay, so we're, we're looking at a general growth effect. Um, it is quite possible, and one of the great things about using the NCI panel is that you can screen up to 35 to 40 of those, um, those cell lines against an individual compound with an unknown mechanism of action. And then you can feed that data into the um, compare algorithm. Uh, this, this, <coughs> excuse me, this compare algorithm contains information on a number of um, compounds with known mechanisms of action and also a diversity set of 38,000 compounds. And it's the pattern of activity of your unknown compound can be used, can be deconvoluted and compared with the activity of known compounds and a putative mechanism of action can be identified. And it's always very useful to have a, a phenotypic observation of a cytostatic or cytotoxic effect but if you can combine that with a preliminary view of what the mechanism of action is, that's a very sort of powerful um, approach, uh, which is enabled by the discompare analysis. And um, so does this work in practice? And um, you can see here in this example where we're um, screening a number of different cell lines, um, one of which um, the RPMI8226 cell actually expresses the VEGF receptor too. And this compound here, compound A, is actually a selective inhibitor of that. So you can see where even though you have a, a wide range of different cancer cell lines, where you have a specific target mediated activity where you understand what it is and you have a compound where you understand its, um, its specificity, you can see a difference between, uh, between this and other cell lines which don't express this particular target. So it is, it is a quite useful and, and powerful methodology. Um, you can look at a, um, a sort of a larger range of um, outputs from the compare analysis. Here we're comparing for the standard compound cisplatin and we profiled it against 35 cell lines. If you compare it against the, the standard set in compare, which I think at the moment is about 170 or so compounds, you can see that the mechanism of action of the matched compounds or the correlated compounds are similar to that of cisplatin and cisplatin is a DNA cross-linking compound. You can see it picks up cisplatin itself, but also other compounds with similar mechanisms of action. If you then go ahead and compare um, our cisplatin results against the diversity set of 38,000, you can see you actually pick up mitoplatin, which is an added of cisplatin, but you also pick up higher within the ranking. And this is five out of 38,000 compounds with similar mechanisms of action, which is cross-linking DNA. So you've got, I think, with the, um, 
the compare analysis combined with the phenotypic approaches of the cell type glow method, you've got a very good way of identifying um, compound effects, but also getting a first view of the um, potential mechanisms of action. But um, everything's not exactly perfect, um, so that you can do a lot, but there's other things that we'd like to do. And we, we're really interested in how we can potentially improve this process. And I think it, it's fair to say that ATP detection, as with most methods, it is not a universal readout. Um, some cell growth and, and toxicity, toxicity mechanisms are not adequately reflected. And you can see this quite nicely. I encourage you to go and have a look at this um, paper by Chanetal in, in, in Plus One. Um, and those guys found um, particular instances for um, certain compounds, particularly those which are DNA synthesis targeting agents, such as gemcitabine and, and topocide. Those, um, those compounds also cause increases in the size of the cells and the mitochondrial content of cells. And in those cases, the consequence is that ATP determination actually radically um, underestimates the, uh, the cytotoxic effects of the compounds. So you've got an issue there for compounds of a particular mechanism of action. It's not a universal reader. I think also what's quite interesting to be able to, to get a better handle on, particularly an early part of a, um, a profiling effort, is what the time dependence of the cytotoxic effect is that you're, you're monitoring. Some membrane disrupting agents and, and you know, sort of nasty um, compounds would generally have their effects within minutes or hours, whereas those such as cisplatin, which are DNA cross-linking um, compounds, their, their kinetics happen over um, several tens of hours or even days. And it might, it's extremely useful from our perspective to be able to um, identify which compounds are acting rapidly, which are potentially a bit slower. That might give you some more information about the potential mechanisms of action. And we can help or use that information to help us in compound prioritization. I think there's a, a third area um, where some um, non-ATP detection method, for instance, would give us a benefit. Um, you really want to sort of eliminate some of the detection steps and that you know, on one level serves to reduce reagent costs, but also, as I've shown earlier on, there are assay artifacts associated with some compounds and for the instance of cisplatin, for instance, it's, it's hitting in the counter screen. So you want to avoid that. So what we've done is to um, make use of the fact that you can get the um, the stain-free or stainless imaging capability of the Ensign system. And here's some um, experimental work that we did. Again, these are some fairly small-scale preliminary experiments, but some quite interesting results in there. For an MCF7 line, which we seeded it in two hours, you can see here, um, it's got two separate plates, you can see a steady increase in the, um, the confluency, as observed using bright field imaging. And that's you know, quite reasonable. The measurement time is, is less than four minutes per plate, which is quite low. So we're seeing a, you know, quite a nice assessment there of the kinetics of the, and the increase in cell confluency. Now we, we wanted to profile some, um, some standard compounds. One of those is colchicin. Colchicin. Um, colchicin is a compound which affects cell mitosis by inhibiting, <clears throat> excuse me, microtubule polymerization. And it does that by a binding to, to tubulin. And these are dose response curves, concentration on the bottom. <clears throat> on the left hand side, you can see we've got cell type of glow results. Um, we've got an IC50 of around um, 0 0.05 micromole there. Excuse me, I'm something <clears throat> Yeah, an IC50 value of about 0 0.05 mic uh, micromole there. If we compare that to the confluency measurement, which comes out from the bright field analysis, you can see you get a very similar IC50 value of 0 0.03 micromole. <clears throat> and then interestingly, if we look at the cell roughness parameter, which Norbert has described earlier on, you can see again, we get a, a nice dose response format with the, the um, cell roughness parameter increasing the compound concentration and uh, um, a, an approximate IC50 of about 0 0.02 micromole. And it, in some senses, the cell roughness parameter, so in this case, appears to be and slightly more sensitive to cytotoxicity than either the cell type of law or even the confluency. There could be a sense there that we're, we're picking up some, some earlier or um, more subtle cytotoxic effects with, with the cell roughness parameter. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So we can we repeat the same sets of experiments using a, a renal cell cancer line um, 7860 again with culture sync. You can see here we see pretty much the same results with the cell type of assay, We're getting our, our classic um, um, cytostatic and cytotoxic effect. Our IC50s are about 0 0.06 micromolar. We're getting pretty much the same values with the cell confluency measurement, but with cell roughness we're getting IC50s of about 0 0.03 micromole. So it's looking a little bit more sensitive. But what's quite interesting is that you have a, um, three essentially completely orthogonal readings here. They've got the cell type of glow analysis, you've got your confluency readout, and you've got your cell roughness readout. And it's worth pointing out that all of these measurements took place in the same well. Um, first of all, we, we did the imaging side, and then we, and we added the reagents for the, um, for the cell type of glow analysis. So you can get orthogonal readouts from the same well, and it's, it's to multiplexing, which is quite exciting and quite useful. Um, you can see here, for, a, um, for again, for the MCF7 breast cancer cell line with another um, German cytotoxic compound, gently in violet, or crystal violet. And um, you can see in the cell type of analysis, we've got a, a slightly, it's slightly less potent compound, um, 9.7 micromolar. Confluency is looking a little bit um, more potent, it's 5.7 micromolar. But cell roughness, again, is, is quite a lot lower. And we think, again, that there may be some um, an early hint of cytotoxic effects which are coming out from the cell roughness parameter. So, so it, I think in terms of it, an overview of the performance of the um, system and based upon our, our work with it so far, I think the, the bright field imaging with the end side certainly gives us um, results for cell confluency, which are pretty consistent with the data that we get from ATP determination. Um, but it's done in, in a very short time, less than four minutes per plate, and without the need for additional reagents. What's particularly exciting from my perspective, so getting a lot of stuff for free, as it were, these extracted morphological features such as cell roughness seem to provide useful orthogonal secondary readouts, which may, in some senses, be more sensitive than either the cell type of glow, ATP determination, or the confluency measurement. Um, in our work so far, the, the imaging time has been around four minutes per plate, and I think that's quite important that the, the imaging time is, is, is short. And we don't want the plate to be sitting on the reader for extended amounts of time. So beyond with the four minutes per plate, we, we don't see any unnecessary perturbations to the cells and, and they minimize. And we have looked at a couple of other cell lines as well, A549 and NDAMB, and their data are under evaluation. But the results so far show that the optimization of the image analysis algorithms to give you the confluency measures and the roughness measures appears to be relatively straightforward, at least for, for our team here. So I think. What we want to do ultimately is to be able to extend these analysis to the full 35 panel, 35 cell lines that we have um, of the 60, and to show it, it's a generally applicable methodology in the way that something like um, cell type laws as well. So we don't want to be um, doing very bespoke um, creations of image analysis algorithms, and it doesn't seem to be necessary. It seems to be a straightforward process. So where, where are we going next with the end site and, and, and part of our sort of collaborative work with um, Perth and Noma? And we're going to extend the image analysis process to cover additional cell lines and also non-cancer cell lines and some primary cell lines that we're interested in as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, I think compounds with um, different mechanisms of action, we want to be able to differentiate those in terms of the time dependence of the onset of cytotoxicity and differentiate between cytotoxic and cell growth effects. And what we haven't been up to able to do up till now is to unequivocally differentiate between a live cell and a dead cell in stainless imaging and we want to be able to do that and I think we're getting a strong indication that the, and the cell roughness parameter is the way to go down. And we want to be able to profile compounds which have been described as problematic in ATP determination or endpoint assays. Those are compounds which cause increases in cell size and which cause increases in the number and density of mitochondria. And essentially, our, our medium-term goal is to be able to um, complement at first um, our current um, cell type of glow or ATP determination platform, but in the, in the medium to long term to replace that with stainless imaging and bright field illumination and use that in a way whereby we can both um, monitor cell proliferation and the effects of compounds on, on growth, but also look at subtle morphological changes which are associated with cell death for instance, roughness and cytotoxicity.
So um, thank you very much. And I'm going to pass back to what um, Paul can now. Okay, thank you. So, so let me summarize before we go to the question section. So here you find the summary on the Insight Multimode Reader plus imaging. I hope you have seen clearly from the three of us and learned that by combination of cell imaging with labeled and label-free technologies, you can get more predictive data in the drug discovery process. How you can improve your data quality and reduce costs in cell-based assays. And last but not least, how the inside plus the cell imaging could give you benefit and make it an interesting, uh, ideal instrument for the use in anti-cancer drug discovery. For more information, I'd like to route you on our website, perkinelma.com slash site. More to come on the site, so please watch out. And now I'd like to open the floor for any questions. Just as a reminder, on the left side, you find a Q&A box. Let's see what kind of questions we have. There's one, sorry to, to smile, but there's something about uh, soccer. So we all like soccer and we are in Germany. So sorry, I had to smile. Um, any prediction regarding the, the, the soccer team on Sunday? What shall I say? I vote for Germany. Uh, let's go back to the signs. Um, what objective can be accommodated in the unit for imaging? That's a question for Norbert. I'm not sure whether objectives means objective lenses in this case. I so, believe the, the forward factor is the question. Yeah, so we use forward <laughs> magnification lens here, and uh, the instrument is designed for this magnification, for this lens. So it would not be easy to exchange it. Okay, thank you very much. Next question here. Can the imaging focus accommodate round bottom welds or do you need flat plastic welds or glass bottom plates? So we can work nicely with flat plastic or glass bottom plates. Um, we have not yet tested round bottom plates. I doubt that it will be very well. That is a nice keyword for me just as a comment. Um, so we can use the EPIC a glass plate and we can read, we can use it for label free technologies as well as for the cell imaging. So really have a multiplexing here. Um, another question, you have mentioned the imaging time is to be under four minutes. Does this only include the acquisition or does it include the data analyze as well? Yeah, that's a question. So the, the data analysis runs in parallel to the image acquisition. And so far, we did not find any analysis that slowed down the, uh, the total process. So typically, the analysis is even faster than the, uh, than the measurements are. Thanks to Acapella, because this is a very efficient calculation machine. Okay, more questions to come here. What are the minimum maximum measurement time for a 96 or a 384 well plate, depending on the measurement mode? I think it's again one for you. Know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we have to wait for well, more questions. For the, the fastest time, of course, is on the fly absorbance measurements. That's around six seconds or seven seconds for a 96 bar plate measurement time. And if I recall correctly, it's something like 12 seconds or 13 seconds for a 384 bar plate. Maximum measurement time, of course, are any long-term kinetics. Label free sometimes runs overnight. Uh, other assays can run over days. Okay, you have another one. Are samples analyzed with different studies as fluorescence, absorbance, alpha technology? Unfortunately, not see the end of the question. But yes, they are. We have already seen data from film that combine luminescence and imaging. We have combined 
label free and imaging very successfully as well. And you can, of course, also combine other technologies. Yeah, just a quick add on to that, and I think it was also asked earlier on you do have to use a clear bottom plate for the imaging, yeah. which isn't optimal, obviously, for, um, for luminescence. But in the case of um, these ATP determin ashes, determination assays, there's signal, there's sufficient signal that it isn't really an issue. So you get about a, a, a halving of the overall signal intensity, but normally you're dealing with several hundred thousand counts and, and it's not an issue. Okay, thank you. Well, next question, do you have any comparison head to head between the inside and high content like operetta or opera data? That's a very good point. So in the beginning, we did some comparison studies and we were quite pleased with the outcome that enforces our strength and our optimism that we have chosen the right optical design. You raised a good point. Unfortunately, we have not wrapped it up such that we could show it here in the seminar, but we'll follow up. Next one. A lot of imaging questions. Unfortunately, <laughs> no, no questions for you, Phil, so far what I can see. Are you able to image all four colors simultaneously or is each channel acquired sequentially? So Again, nobody. Each channel is acquired sequentially by just changing the excitation light source. So you don't need to change uh, any filter in between. That's an explanation why we're so fast. Right? Yeah, that's the reason for being so fast. The Opera Phoenix uses up to four different cameras to read simultaneously different colors that would not fit into the inside. Let's take another one. Is there any environmental control, temperature control, or gas? Uh, especially, that was the question. It's important uh, for kinetic measurements of light cells. Would you like to answer? No, I can take. So we have temperature control on board. And uh, based on the studies we've seen so far, either with the addition of certain buffer ingredients, which enables the cells to stay longer, as well as uh, long-term label-free assays really demonstrated clearly that uh, gas control is not required. But if you run it in automatic fashion, I think there was a point raised by Phil. Yeah, maybe uh, you can comment. So, on so that. I think it, it depends on, on the time scale of your kinetic events. So you know, Fair this point. is not a flipper system, for instance. You're not adding a calcium solution and, or adding a, a salt solution linked for a calcium flux. And um, I think this is suited for observing kinetic effects that take take place over an hour's time scale. And I think that that's quite good in for that. And but you would need potentially some form of automation with a, um, an adjacent incubator to feed cell plates into there. So you, you have the you know, potential disadvantage that you can't control while it's on the, on the plate, while it's on, on the reader, but you have the potential advantages that you could sequentially screen many plates with cycle times of an hour or, or two hours between them. So it's kinetics over a slightly longer time, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. Next question, a very simple one. Uh, what is the primary difference between the operetta and the inside if I want to do high content? Very simple. As I pointed out in the introduction, the inside is capable to read cells at cellular resolution. So if you are interested in simple assays, live dead assays counting, the inside is the method of choice. If you want to go subcellular, subcellular uh, high content, then the operator is the right instrument to choose. Yeah, so the, 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 that's important. In addition, on inside, you have the availability of conventional MMD technologies. Let's go for the next one. Ah, here's something about something for Phil. During the ATP detection, probably there were some differences on this detection. With this future differences, uh, would it be a signal for a diagnosis? Um, I, I think what we're looking for with the, um, using the, the, the bright field imaging um, is, and you know, potentially as well as the digital phase imaging, is to differentiate between live and, and, and dead cell um, populations. But whether you could use it as a, um, as a diagnostic test, I think that would be um, a little bit beyond 
beyond its capabilities mm -hmm. of uh, you, okay. you need to sort of um, a different kind of setup for diagnostic tests. But certainly for um, drug discovery applications, I think it would be a really interesting and useful alternative to, um, to using ATP. Thank you very much, Phil. This was the last question. We have a lot of questions. We make sure that we uh, answer your question via email. So thank you very much for joining this morning or this afternoon in the US and Europe. Uh, we wish you a nice day. Thank you very much. And uh, have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.